Welcome everyone to today's live talk. I'm extremely happy to host today's session with two very prominent global leaders. Today we will talk about how business can contribute to fight the most important global challenges of our times, like climate change of rising inequality, among others. My name is Carlota Gomez de la Oz and I'm heading international communications at Bayer and I'm very happy to moderate the session today. Let me just give a few highlights before we start. As you know, over the next few decades, we will be more and more confronted with the effects of climate change and global inequalities. Climate change is currently on the top of the political agenda. For example, in Europe, mainly farmers are currently feeling the effects of climate change through har harvest losses. However, in the Global South, millions of people are already losing their livelihoods. The consequences of global warming are massive, ranging from extreme weather, hunger, refugee flows and conflicts. At the same time, inequality is unfortunately on the rise. And to name just three figures, around 10% of the world's population was undernourished last year. 80% of the world's population lives in low and middle income countries with few healthcare resources. And one out of five children is not allowed to go to school. This is terrible. Looking at these massive challenges, our guest today argues that business can help to tackle this. However, we have to rethink how business operates and creates value. We need to build companies that provide more to the world than they use or take, as simply as that. In other words, we need to become net positive. In order to learn uh, in more detail what net positive means and how we can get there, we have invited Paul Polman. And let me introduce Paul. He was the CEO of Unilever from 2009 to 2019. Before, he was the CFO of Nestle and worked in various positions at Procter & Gamble. So he knows all the major global consumer good companies. He focused on Unilever's business activities on multiple stakeholders and long-term value creation, committing the company to doubling its sales while keeping its footprint flat, which led, and, my, and Paul will, will explain, Unilever being ranked as the most sustainable company by peers and experts. Today, he's the co-founder and chair of Imagine, a for benefit organization that mobilizes business leaders around tackling climate change and global inequality. The Financial Times described him as a standout CEO of the past decade. Wow. Today, he's our guest and welcome, Paul. Thank you, uh, Carlotta, for having me and thank you, Werner, as well. Always good to see you guys. Thank you. And as you know, with, with me as well, uh, no other one than our CEO, Werner Baumann. Werner, as you know, uh, he's the chairman of the board of management at Bayer, and he's also the company's uh, chief sustainability offer, and therefore the best possible discussion for Paul. So thanks uh, very much, Werner, for joining this discussion, and welcome. Thank you. Um, first of all, thanks to Paul for doing this, and uh, I'm very much looking forward to uh, an interesting hour or so. So let's jump in. But before uh, we start the discussion, let me uh, cordially invite uh, all the participants today uh, to also be part of the discussion. So please use the comment function for this purpose, and I will see your comments and incorporate them in, in your questions and in the discussions. So let's jump in. Uh, and Paul, my first question goes to you. After your impressive career as a manager in international business, you have decided to work as a sustainability advocate instead of, I don't know, just retiring. So I'm very curious to know what drives your passion and engagement for sustainability. Well, I've always uh, explained to people that uh, I don't like the word retiring. It sounds like you were tired before and you're tired again. And that's not something that uh, I aspire to. But uh, seriously, you know, there uh, for me, it has always been a, a question of, of uh, human development in the end. The world will only function if we make it more inclusive, if we make it more equitable, if we fight for these basic human values of dignity and respect, uh, equity, compassion. And uh, 
the more I was in business and made my career in business, the more I realized the incredibly important role that business has to play to ensure that our economic system works for all. In our uh, book, Net Positive, we talk about business profiting from solving the world's problems, not from creating the world's problems, from answering a simple question of if the world is better off because your business is in it or not. What I like about Bayer and Werner's leadership and working with you guys and looking at it from the outside is your uh, health for all, hunger for none, is in fact that overall objective of trying to create this better world. So that's what I'm fighting for. In my career, I've been very lucky, but I've also had a possibility to understand how business functions, what the challenges are that business has to deal with, and how I can now use my knowledge, my competing platform, if you want to, to ensure that we move faster on the sustainable development agenda. That's why we created Imagine, which works with uh, companies in food and fashion, in tourist and travel to move the agenda forward. That's why I'm looking at leadership development, which is so important. After this meeting, I'm off to the Said Business School at Oxford, which I chair to talk about uh, the broader future of leadership. And that's really why I also started writing the book Net Positive to reframe people's mindsets into moving from CSR or less bad, which simply isn't good enough anymore, to really getting into a mindset of a restorative, reparative, regenerative, just like nature is, by the way, which we call net positive. So that's the exciting thing I'm currently focused on. Good. Um, Werner, and you are the CEO of Bayer, but at the same time, you are the chief sustainability officer. Why sustainability is a responsibility of the board leader? Why do you take this person, the, uh, the personal ownership of this topic? So first of all, before I go there, uh, I think all of us are very thankful of what Paul is doing with um, truly inspirational leadership. It's one of the biggest challenges that mankind has faced and, and a reset uh, that most businesses in the world have to go through. So what can be more important for not, not only a CEO, but, but a board of management uh, that has responsibility for 100,000 people and their families? Uh, and hundreds of millions of moments of truth with the customers that we serve, then making our businesses more sustainable and actually the company force for good. And with health for all and hunger for none, and the fact that uh, we are a real systemic force for good, if we fully lever the potential of the company in health and nutrition, this transformation and change agenda needs the highest attention of the board of management and you are just as much as it is really important to many, many people, many, many of our employees and their families, just as important to uh, the board of management uh, and myself. That's why uh, I choose to be the chief sustainability officer uh, and uh, have also the public affairs sustainability and science organization report directly to me. So let's go to you, Paul. Um, I have your book here, a very interesting read. Uh, you, it's it's uh, called Net Positive, How Courageous Companies Thrive by Giving More Than They Take. So what characterizes net positive companies and how do they contribute to solve these global challenges such, such as climate change of inequality? Yeah, well, let me first uh, congratulate Werner because he's taken the, the right decision to take sustainability as a responsibility under his wings. And because Werner understands that it is part of a successful long-term business model where you have to cater to multiple stakeholders, where you have to make sustainability the core of your strategy. And he understands better than, than most CEOs why that is becoming an incredibly important uh, business driver. If that doesn't start from the top down, it's very difficult for the companies to really ultimately become net positive. So. I want to congratulate you for that because I know that the jobs are difficult and you're actually taking on more responsibilities, but um, you're picking the right ones to safeguard not only the, the next 150 years of buyer, but making it even more successful. You know, this year World Overshoot Day, which is the day that we use up more resources than the world can replenish, was July 29th, which actually means that 
after that day, every day after, we're stealing from future generations. We're living well beyond our planetary boundaries. Uh, we cannot have infinite growth on a finite planet, and anything we can do by definition forever is unsustainable. And what we've seen with COVID once more is a reminder what that destruction of our planetary boundaries does. COVID has shown us we can't have healthy people on an unhealthy planet. It has also shown us the complex interrelationship between biodiversity, human health, climate change, economic inequality, racial tension, and many more things. And this is, uh, uh, above all, it has made us realize what the enormous costs of failures are. We spent in Europe and the US alone about $17 trillion to save lives and livelihoods. The global economy, according to the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, is estimated to have lost $27 trillion in GDP this decade alone because of COVID. And the story isn't finished yet. So we're starting to realize that the cost of inaction, the cost of failure, if you want to, is significantly higher than the cost of action, which makes it such an attractive proposition to start to move from being less bad, which simply isn't good enough anymore, to not even being neutral on net zero, but to start to think regenerative, restorative, reparative, which is net positive. The hallmarks of a net positive company are many of the elements that uh, Werner is uh, putting in place in, in Bayer as well, but it's good to really um, put that straight in front of us. The first one is that the leadership and the business takes responsibility of its total handprint in society, all consequences, intended or not. Many companies take responsibility of scope one and two, which is under their control when you look at climate change, for example, but very few take responsibility of scope three and beyond, where actually most of your carbon emissions might be. You cannot outsource anymore your value chain and also outsource your responsibilities. That doesn't work. So buyer is extending that responsibility by looking at regenerative agriculture, protecting biodiversity, creating livelihoods for smallholder farmers, helping uh, uh, hundreds of millions of women getting access to contraception. It is taking responsibility of your total handprint in society. All consequences, positive or negative. Um, a, a good example of a company that goes terribly wrong in this is Facebook, where they take an enormous uh, pride in the benefits that the platform provides in education or business startups, but refuse to take responsibility for addiction of children, undermining of democracy, or hate speech, and it just simply doesn't work anymore. The second one is that these businesses understand that they have to optimize the return for all stakeholders. You cannot be successful long term if you don't have your employees engaged, your communities to support, or uh, uh, relationships with your suppliers that are resilient. And we've seen that even more so during COVID, that companies that take care of all of their stakeholders have been more resilient and more successful. The third characteristic is that uh, they see shareholder return as a result of what you do, not as an objective. The objective is really to address the issues of people and planet, but doing it well, doing it with smart people, you also have your shareholders benefit over time. In Unilever, over the 10 year period, it resulted in a 300% shareholder return. And finally, a characteristic of a net positive company is a company that actually also works on the broader transformations that society needs, working with civil society, with government to put the system changes in place to get these uh, structural changes that we need. A good example of that would be uh, working with governments on labeling, on stopping deforestation, on putting structural plans in place to get plastics out of the oceans. And here again, there are some signs uh, or hallmarks of buyer being actively involved in increasingly shaping these frameworks. You are uh, one of the key drivers of the water summit that the UN is putting in place in two years time. And that is would be one of the examples of where you take responsibility beyond your own company to make the broader system work. Net positive companies answer a very simple question is, uh, how is the world better off because my business is in it or not? And the leaders understand that they indeed have to profit from solving the world's problems, not creating the world's problems. My final comment is that the book doesn't shy away from also dealing with some of the tougher challenges 
that require consistency in all we do. How do we deal with money in politics, uh, CEO salaries, uh, human rights, uh, corruption, uh, money, uh, sorry, the uh, trade associations often arguing different things than uh, what the companies are preaching. So this consistency, even amongst these tougher choices, is a very important component of building that trust that is needed to unlock that uh, prosperity that we're all after. But uh, Werner, building on, on um, Paul's answer, and, and he mentioned several key uh, flagship initiatives under the sustainability strategy, you launched it, that comprehensive strategy a couple of years ago. My question to you is what are you most proud of when looking back at you know these uh, 24 months after the launch of this strategy? And how, wh where do you think that, where do we perform on this way to become a net positive company? So, Carlotta, these are many questions. Uh, and I try my best to answer. First of all, um, uh, I, I'm very proud of the fact that uh, we did not create a sustainability strategy where you know, a lot of people would say, hey, this is greenwashing. Yeah, and you're kind of framing something uh, that you should have done to begin with. And, and the second, even more important thing is that you said, well, we do have a sustainability strategy in order to frame uh, the impact that we want to generate and to elevate it to people's minds, how important it is to us, both inside and outside of the company, that we didn't fall into the trap of saying, well, we do have a business strategy and a sustainability strategy, which links totally with what, what Paul was just saying. Yeah, so this has to be an integral part of everything that we are doing. Yeah, so uh, this is not an afterthought. Um, being sustainable in our, our operations, uh, driving for the right things, being a uh, stakeholder centric company uh, that does good for the right reasons. While it, of course, also we are for profit company. We want to do well uh, so that we can create the latitude and the space uh, to uh, invest and finance things that are really important to our customers, to our people, our other stakeholders. So that that we did that in such a comprehensive fashion uh, is uh, you're the thing that I'm most proud of. And uh, as you know, many, many times, uh, well, a lot of companies uh, have uh, tried that as well. They fell short because they forgot about uh, you know, the incentivation systems where we ask people to go for very lofty and ambitious targets, but then you know, there's a disconnect between what we ask them to do and what we incentivize them for. So we solved that, I think, as well, also in terms of uh, how we incentivize our management, senior management, uh, of course, also the board of management with a long-term incentive plan uh, that has 20% uh, uh, weight on our sustainability targets yeah, and our um, uh, inclusion and diversity targets and the three times 100 million challenges that um, Paul mentioned. Yeah. So to really raise 100 million farmers out of poverty by the end of the decade, uh, to give uh, you know, 100 million women access to modern family planning so that they can live a self-determined life and uh, be, uh, let's say, much more impactful when it comes to you know, the livelihood of their families. Uh, and uh, also getting a, a broad based issue addressed, uh, not only in the developing world, you know, the US just as bad when it comes to malnutrition, Yeah, to really help people to have the right nutritional intake with uh, the 100 million challenge that we are focusing on consumer health. So all of those targets uh, need, let's say, a long term perspective, longer term plans that stretch way beyond a year or two or three years in order for them to be appropriately funded and then successful. And that's what I'm particularly proud of uh, that we have done. And it actually resonates very, very well with our employee base, with our people, with uh, your sustained super high engagement course course. You know, if you look at high performing organizations and uh, where people feel at ease with, let's say, the mission and the vision of the company, um, and that's what's being played back very, very strongly by our people. Good. And now back to you, uh, Paul. So we already had the pleasure to have you at Bayer before the pandemic hit uh, all of us. Uh, so maybe a, a similar question to you. How do you evaluate the progress that we have made at Bayer in the last 24 months? And in which areas do we have to get better compared to these, you know, leading net positive companies? 
Uh, well, again, I think that's that um, probably merits more time to discuss. But what I like about uh, Werner uh, as a leader and, and buyer is that you are both operating in the areas of health and food, if I may call it that way. But that with the food summit, with looking at our food systems, which I'm a little bit more familiar with, people inc increasingly um, see the importance of, of uh, healthy diets. And, and these two come very closely together. Uh, you are one of the few companies, as Werner was explaining, that can really make a true difference in setting goals of reaching 100 million people on their dietary habits, on their health, uh, uh, on their livelihoods with smallholder farmers. There are many, very few companies that can talk hundreds of millions. So you really, as an individual company, with the partnerships that you are creating, can have a fundamental difference on the sustainable development goals and have a multiplier in society. And that's why it's worth investing in it and, and spending time with you, because that is, for me, the most important thing to focus on. I like your vision, which is health for all and hunger for none. And that's become very energizing, as Werner is showing in your engagement scores. It's driving not only the values of your company, but you're actually making it come alive. And it's, it's values and behaviors, if you want to, that ultimately decide the culture. And although it will take a little bit of time in any company, it took in Unilever six, seven years before I really saw the changes in culture. I do believe that you are definitely on the right track and should not uh, waver. I also like your purpose, which is uh, science for a better life. So what you do well is a little bit what I would call uh, perhaps two things. The one thing of a sign of a courageous leader and a net positive company is that you set the goals that are needed in society, not the goals that you can get away with. You, you set goals that make you feel uncomfortable, that you might not even have all the answers for on how to get there, but that you know that the world needs. And that is a sign of courage. You, you do that in terms of with, uh, uh, taking responsibility of your total impact in society. That takes courage. You seek the broader partnerships to achieve those. That takes courage. And you're a pioneer in many of these areas. You were the first ones to sign on on the LEAVE coalition uh, in Brazil in, uh, in, uh, in, in working on uh, regenerative agriculture. You are the first ones really that, that put it in practice with uh, uh, thousands of smallholder farmers and make that actually public so that it can scale at a broader level. You're not afraid to attack these broader and tougher issues. And I think there are some successes that you're starting to see already. On carbon, you're making progress, which is very important. I think if most companies would do what you're doing, being uh, science-based and uh, reducing your emissions across your value chain, uh, then I think the world would already be better off. Uh, you're betting on big things with your LEAPS program, which I find very encouraging. And, and you're actually very practical. Stephen Covey said it very well in his book, Seven Habits, when he said, you cannot talk yourself out of things you have behaved yourself into. And Werner once more is also right to say we have to not only align our strategy with these planetary boundaries, which you are doing very well, but we also have to focus on actually walking the walk and letting people talk about what we have achieved to be um, uh, credible. Your internal carbon price of $100 per ton, your transparency of, of progress that you show against the variables, that you report against the um, specific work that you're doing with the thousands of smallholder farmers, your progress on diversity and inclusion. These would be all examples where you're putting your work to action. And I think that is the most important thing. Where are areas that you can always set the bar higher? And I don't want to be pretentious. You guys are focused on the right things, but we cannot stop until we are at one and a half degrees. We haven't solved it. Glasgow did a lot of things but we, we haven't achieved it yet. So we need to keep being aggressive. We need to keep fighting hard to ensure that we move at the scale and speed. And there every company can, um, can, can step up, in my opinion. Uh, we need the broader partnerships. You have some signs of a partnerships emerging, but to attack these really tough issues, uh, tough nuts to crack in society, we need to form the broader partnerships. And you've been very busy with your own company, with the integration, with putting your strategies in place. You have formed some of the partnerships, but now we can probably look at it 
going one step further. I was very uh, pleased, by the way, at the COP where I was for 10 days to see Andreas and a, a broad delegation from Bayer. And you can be proud of having been there and having been a big part of that. And then it takes time to integrate in all of your departments. Undoubtedly, in any company, I had the same in Unilever, there are some skeptics and cynics still that wonder why this is all needed and why we shouldn't focus on other things. Uh, but this is a, a, a team sports that has to be owned by all of the leaders. It has to be uh, implanted in all of your departments. It has to become the driver of your growth. In fact, the reason for being. And that's why I'm so pleased to see that Werner himself has taken that responsibility and not delegated that to others. And it just otherwise wouldn't work. So my conclusion is, if I may be honest, is you're well on the way. Uh, you're making more progress than I had envisioned with all the challenges that are out there. You're certainly amongst the leading companies that I feel passionate about. And um, But you also realize in a very humble way that you still have some way to go to translate that into lasting business effect and the multiplier in society to show that that is the only successful way of running businesses long term. But I would like to focus now on one of the, your elements that you, you just mentioned about the internal buy-in. And my question goes to you, uh, Werner. So our engagement service, of course, is a good part of the organization that is uh, fully on board, but there's a part that probably is not yet there. So my question to you is, what do you think that the reason why and what can we do to change that, Werner? Yeah, so first of all, I want to just take 20 seconds and uh, pick up on one topic that um, Paul mentioned. We do have targets and objectives that we want to hit by 2030, but they are nothing more than a milestone on our journey. And if I go back to the discussion we had in the board when we were talking about our vision, how for all hunger for none, there was one very interesting debate that we had where we say, hey, Let's not overcommit. So how many people do we want to make healthy? And then Stefan Ulrich, my colleague who runs Pharma, said the sentence and said, regardless how many there are, I won't stop. There's always the next one, the next life we can save. And there's always the next family that we can raise, rise out of poverty. And there's that next hungry mouth that needs to be fed. So that's how we came to the vision. Health for all, hunger for none. It is ultra ambitious and it will keep us going regardless how lofty our interim and objectives that need to be measurable on our way are going to be. So on, on the second one, you know, the great thing about uh, our organization that I've always admired is that our people really want to do good. Yeah. So they want to be uh, you know, acknowledged uh, as part of the communities that we live in and that we work in, and they want to be seen as the people who do the right thing. Yeah, and you know, Paul mentioned you're one or the other company uh, that cannot claim to be on that track. Uh, I see a very, very strong sense of purpose, actually with all our people, and then uh, I think in many, many areas that has sunk in deeply. Yet there's always a risk that people say, hey, your know, management should do this and this and management should do that and that. And this is not OK and that is OK, not OK. And my, my answer to this one is um, on our journey towards becoming a fully sustainable and then ultimately eventually a net positive company, each of our 100,000 people Board of management and me personally included have to make it an I issue. What can I do? What can I contribute? Where can I provide leverage towards um, actually taking on more speed in becoming sustainable? And it starts every single day with what we are doing, how we are working, how we get to work, how we travel, how we dress, how we consume. Yeah. So you know that. Um, that uh, paradigm of buying ourselves something yeah, only to throw it away once we don't like it anymore you know, is one of the least sustainable things I can think of. Yeah, Much rather 
uh, you're going for things that can last, uh, things that you can uh, continue to utilize as long as it fits for purpose and 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 yeah so the way you know, uh, what we eat how we eat yeah uh, so so all of these things are uh, very very important and it starts with each and every one of us uh, Paul, you mentioned uh, COP26, um, so we, ha we have already attended this. Um, so what do you think uh, about the outcome of COP26 and what are the remaining issues that policymakers still need to, to, to address? So I think uh, the COP26 was uh, pro probably, it might surprise you, but over delivered politically, but under delivered scientifically still. Let me first be very clear, we cannot stop until we are sure that we are at one and a half degrees. Uh, anything above that is a disaster. The difference between one and a half degrees and two degree warming is exponential. We're talking here about logarithmic scales. So even at one and a half degrees, a lot of people will suffer, countries will disappear. But the good thing about the COP are, are a few things. The first of all is all the countries recommitted to the one and a half degrees. That has never happened. Paris bent the curve from four degrees to two degrees, uh, three degrees. Uh, Glasgow bent the curve from three degrees to two degrees. That's a seismic change. Now we have the commitment from all the countries to really still strive for one and a half degrees. Glasgow also uh, made clear that fossil and coal need to get out of the system. This is the first time that they mentioned the fossil fuels. In fact, a big agreement on methane, 30% reduction of methane emissions between now and 2030. We've never seen that. Glasgow agreed the rule book or Article 6 on the carbon markets, which we have been negotiating for uh, since uh, 2012 uh, and now uh, have come to a conclusion on this, is a very important one. The establishment of the Sustainable Standard Board to go to a broader measurement system, not only financial returns, but also environmental and social. The um, clear uh, presence of the private sector on the $30 billion, trillion dollars of uh, financial capital, half the world's capital, making commitments to be net zero. 5,000 companies in the race to zero or race to zero breakthrough making commitments. So we've never seen that. Last but not least, a commitment from all the countries to come back next year already, instead of every five years, to set the ambitions higher, signaling the urgency of it. Where did we fall short? We're still not at the one and a half degrees. We show still a low level of solidarity for the emerging markets. We still don't have the 100 billion climate fund, limited funds for loss and damage, which we know we have already, and the transfer and help on technology. So this global lack of solidarity that we also have seen around the vaccines is still uh, paying, uh, playing around, I think, at the global or multilateral level, and we need to attack that. I think at the end of the day, it is now focused on more ambitions, uh, faster action, and a higher level of accountability. And we immediately after the COP, I flew to the United Emirates, which will be hosting the COP in 2028. And we are already starting to discuss as well with, um, with the Egyptians, which will be hosting next year. The final thing I would need to mention, what I think was positive about the COP is that for the first time, people understand that it's not just only the energy transition, but that it also the food system transition is a very important part. Soon, the bigger emitters, I think, will be coming, the, the food companies more so than the energy companies, methane and livestock being a big part of that. But it's 30% of the problem, but also 30% of the solution. And interestingly, changing our food systems, we can do much faster, actually have a higher return of our investments and create this more resilient future. So increasingly, we see science-based targets for nature coming in. We see the recognition that companies need to internalize these externalities. And I think that will be a big piece of the agenda moving forward. So I'm pleased about that. And it plays right in, in the heart of your business. If I would say one thing about buyer is that you're extremely well positioned for the changes that need to happen. We need to change our, our social structure by making it more inclusive. All your healthcare work goes totally in that direction. We need to change our food systems uh, as a major contributor to. Leading science driven as well, and then obviously the overall decarbonization of society 
is what you are driving uh, across your businesses. So you are in the growth vectors of the future. You are at the heart of the sustainable development goals. You are the engine of success for um, for initiatives like the COP26, uh, the COP15 in Kunming, and some of the other ones that we're working on moving forward. Yeah. And we were, of course, here very present in, at COP26. So, Werner, um, when you talk to other business leaders, uh, what is your impression on how the climate emergency is shaping the operating environment of companies? You know, if I uh, if I go back three years, four years, uh, and if I look at where we are today, uh, I would not have thought uh, that the agenda would have changed that dramatically. Yeah. So Paul is uh, not only one, but maybe the pioneer yeah, of driving a sustainable enterprise and uh, the great thing that uh, has happened is that this is on everybody's mind as a number one priority yeah uh, not everybody has figured out how to do it but uh, you know this all goes back to um the fact that there is no argument anymore on whether or not to become sustainable the only argument is how the heck do i get there fast enough what are the new technologies that I need? What are the partnerships that I need? Who can help me also getting real sustainable audited certified offsets? If I you know, continue to have a, um, let's say, energy footprint and a carbon footprint that I cannot get rid of, possibly in the next 10 to 15 years, I maybe reduce it, but I cannot get completely rid of it. Yeah? So where are my partners who can help us do that? So th these are you know, the discussions uh, that are very, very engaging. It's actually also quite rewarding uh, to talk to other people on how they think about uh, what to do in their operations. You always learn a bit. And uh, in particular, when you know, I'm, I'm part of these discussions, uh, people are totally interested, goes back to what Paul says, uh, totally interested in what we are doing. And there is also a massive change that, that I see compared to a few years ago uh, that uh, you know, a lot of people see uh, us as being in the center of the solution. Yeah, when it comes to carbon farming, for example, carbon sequestration, um, you know, with our carpet farming uh, business uh, that uh, we want to scale uh, actually fast. Uh, if I look at uh, your short stature corn, uh, that is going to be, uh, let's say, uh, higher yielding. Uh, uh, with less um, uh, uh, le less uh, your know, uh, footprint, and at the same time uh, will allow for your know, freeing up uh, your acreage, uh, let's say for further intensification, uh, or for things like your know, cover crops, uh, carbon sequestration, reforestation, uh, and the like. Uh, and when I talk about um, your know, nitrogen fixation. Uh, that uh, you know, if we help some plants do it better, uh, would actually significantly reduce uh, the production of uh, your know, nitrogen fertilizer. That uh, you know, in and by itself, this only piece accounts for about four uh, percent of global primary energy use. You see how big the lever is, yeah, and uh, what people see in us that we can do. Yeah, so from time to time, I have the impression that they see even more in us, yeah, than we realize ourselves that we can do uh, and that's of course t totally inspiring. Uh, I think Paul has been, let's say, a great, great contributor yeah, to yeah, that eye-opening experience for us to say, hey, uh, this is not about a company that can do a really, little bit better. This is about a company that can really make a difference yeah, at global scale for human mankind uh, to achieve uh, our UN sustainability goals by 2030 and beyond. Good. So, uh, Paul Werner, what about taking some questions uh, from the audience? Um, maybe let me start with you, Paul. Um, there's a question about what would be your recommendation to generate public trust in changes uh, to sustainability a company does? For example, we as Bayer seem to face situation irrespective of what we are doing. We are perceived as the bad guys uh, of whom uh, nothing we can be, be expected. So what is your recommendation? To, to tackle this uh, or to address public trust and increase public trust? Well, Unilever was associated with uh, deforestation. Uh, we have had uh, issues of human rights in our value chains. Uh, people accuse us of being probably one of the biggest pest uh, polluters in the world. 
uh, so every company has its uh, fair amount of critics and and probably rightfully so we should not be defensive about that but the best answer in all these things is is um, to work on the trust balance and uh, to be trusted you need to be trustworthy and as Werner said um, it can only come from behaving you cannot talk yourself out of things you have behaved yourself into so continuing to do the right things like you are doing continuing to focus on the things that matter continuing to put yourself to the service of society truly in addressing these bigger issues then ultimately your circle of influence grows your credibility grows the trust levels go up and and the more you do that in transparency the more you uh, portray which is really Werner's style as well your humility your humanity if you want to your your empathy for the issues that you're trying to address uh, the more you will enlarge your circle and build these partnerships it's starting to happen already um, you know I would not be uh, sidetracked by some of the critics or some of the people who want you to fail or some of the cynics out there who are often not part of the solutions I'm not saying don't listen to them try to understand them but try to prove that you are uh, getting the right results that you're doing the right things and let the action speak for it and bit by bit you will uh, gain the partnerships you're the first ones as I said with leave you are you're driving the carbon markets you're working on the water summits you are in many of the major health debates uh, you're such an enormous force of that goodness to make your vision and your purpose come alive that the people that really want this world to be better see you as a key partner and ultimately with the results that you're getting in in terms of making these impacts your circle of influence will grow as well so don't let the don't belittle but don't let the the cynics or the skeptics derail you from the mission you're on but another question to you paul what was the most difficult challenge on your way of making unilever net positive well, there were many challenges. It wasn't easy. When we started, there was no real proof that this would really be a value creation exercise. Now we know that companies that actively reduce their negative externalities are also actually better valued by the, the financial market. We can measure now many more things. We know that companies that are more gender diverse at all levels are better performing, that more actively uh, reduce carbon in their value chain are better performing that take care of all of the people that make their businesses successful are better performing. So we have the data now that makes it easier. We see that the ESG funds perform better, but I had that challenge to link it to value creation. And I think that still is a little bit of a challenge with people in a company. Often it takes time for other all the values to be unlocked, but it doesn't mean that you have to change course. In buyer, as far as I can see from the outside, you're doing all the right things. And although at times it might be frustrating that the share price isn't where you want it to be, I am convinced, and I'm actually an investor in buyer, just for full disclosure, I am convinced that with all the things you're doing, that the value will be unlocked. So that, that discussion of how do we attract the right shareholders, how do we link it to value creation, is always a challenge. The second challenge is what you alluded to is, you cannot solve all these challenges alone, nor can you take it on your own shoulders by yourself. You have to be part of these transformative changes. And often we see governments being slow, being sometimes uh, uh, difficult to change policies because it doesn't fit with the political or election cycles. We still have perforce subsidies in agriculture or in fossil. And ultimately for companies to really be able to unlock that potential we're talking about, you do need to work with the governments as well and we certainly found that to be a challenge but increasingly I think the responsible governments of this world understand the power of these partnerships and again an area we should continue to drive forward. Good thanks Paul. Um, Werner a question uh, for you from the audience what is from your perspective uh, the most difficult challenge for Bayer to become net positive? Well, um, it's of course always uh, that uh, we uh, need to do what we say, 
Yeah, uh, and actually then also say what we do. And if I look at where we are today with um, the, uh, let's say the 2030 objectives, I have absolutely no doubt that we are going to get there. I think the biggest risk is uh, to get a little bit too complacent. Yeah, should we be way ahead of the curve rather than pushing even harder? Yeah, uh, towards overachieving uh, our interim objectives uh, towards becoming a net positive company. Uh, of course, the first objective is always when it comes to scope one and scope two uh, to become uh, your, uh, carbon neutral. Uh, but as Paul said, that's not good enough. Uh, the biggest lever we have uh, is scope three with uh, the objective that we want to reduce uh, the carbon footprint of our customers in agriculture by 30 percent. That's a really, really big lever. Yeah, and pushing this one, investing behind that objective um, and making it happen, which goes beyond our own net positive ambition or net neutral ambition, uh, is uh, I, I think uh, you know, the biggest challenge Yeah, that we don't uh, lose focus. Uh, quite frankly, also that we don't embark on too many things yeah, of good stuff that we can do because yeah, there are only so many priorities that you can cater to. Yeah, uh, Picking the biggest ones that make a real difference and then pushing really hard yeah, to make those happen uh, is, uh, is what we should do and uh, what we will do. Good, maybe a question. Sorry, <laughs> you no, wanted to add something? Okay, no, no. good. Um, so a question that always uh, pops up in this kind of conversation. So um, maybe the, the um, personal impact that each of one we can we can bring right to this movement. So there's a question uh, about working towards more sustainable habits and ways of working is a huge challenge. The impact that one of us can make in changing its habits is very limited, according to the person who's asking. So how can we really drive a bigger impact also as, as an individuals? Question for both of you. <laughs> yeah, no, maybe maybe I, I can start. Uh, as I said earlier, you know, it begins with each and every one of us. Yeah. So uh, if I look at uh, you know, what, what I can do, yeah, it, it starts with really little things. Uh, it starts with my diet. Uh, do I have to eat meat each and every day? So uh, the answer is uh, yes, I can do it. And I know that I live a very privileged life, by the way. Uh, I can do it, uh, but uh, you know, not doing it is much better. Yeah, it's actually much better in many, many fashions. Yeah, so I happen to eat meat uh, no, no more than, than once a week. Uh, every single time uh, we are, there's the temptation uh, to uh, you know, enter you know, a limousine. Uh, think twice about it, whether you can't walk the distance. It's good for you physically. It's good for the energy footprint uh, and, uh, and the carbon footprint. Yeah, so uh, using public transportation. Uh, looking at things uh, that I mentioned earlier, you know, one of the great things uh, if you buy real high quality stuff, yeah, that ideally yeah, is handcrafted, uh, things that have been crafted manually can also be repaired. Yeah, repairing rather than throwing away, yeah, and having that, let's say, uh, old paradigm consumption pattern. Uh, these are the things that, you know, quite frankly, uh, I do not always live up to. But I try really, really hard, really hard. Uh, you know, the, the, this 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 thing of uh, let's say privileges uh, uh, and company cars. Uh, I don't I don't have a company car yeah, because uh, I think it's a complete waste in many many fashions and areas. I do have access uh, to people who can drive me when I work, uh, but uh, and they do that very well. But you know, having that, uh, you know that. <sighs> Uh, how how shall, shall I say that best? Uh, this you know, this abundance uh, of uh, uh, of support, uh, this abundance of access yeah, to things that are just comfortable, but also come with very very significant carbon footprints, uh, is something that that I can do and I do, quite frankly, personally. There's other things that you know, come on top of it, uh, but I wouldn't say that uh, you know, I've been pushing myself to do it. You know, our travel footprint is much smaller. Uh, and uh, you know it's been driven by COVID, but I think it's going to be here to last. I'm not going to travel around the world for an hour's meeting or two hours meeting. So uh, uh, not only I, I think all of my colleagues uh, will be making much more uh, uh, intelligent decisions 
on their physical presence when you co-create, yeah, when you, uh, you, you, in, you have to engage personally uh, over a longer period of time. These are the things that we will continue to travel for, uh, uh, for because your personal exchange, uh, your living in social systems, all of us live in social systems are important, but you know, all of these quick trips, go here, go there, yeah, and be you're driven by your travel agenda, you know, this this has to come to an end, and uh, you know, at least for me, it has come to an end. Any thoughts from your side, Paul? No, one has said it well, and it's uh, in Unilever, we call it small actions, big difference. You know, if I'm drinking tea and I'm the only one drinking sustainable tea, what can I do? But you have millions of people drinking tea every hour in the world. If we all move to sustainable tea, you can change the tea industry. So the main drivers of change are signals from the marketplace, and these signals are happening. The growth in food is in healthier food. In mobility, we're moving to electric vehicles, and I could go on and on and on. So in your purchase decisions, in the people you vote for at the uh, elections, in your own lifestyles that Werner talked about, but let's go to companies itself. In a company, what you will notice is that if you uh, live what you believe, and, and Werner gave many examples of that, your circle of influence will grow. Whilst you think you might be alone, soon you're encircled by 10 people, by 100 people, by 1,000 people. And the biggest thing you can do in a company is uh, two things, and we start to see that happen. First of all, in reality, you might be a CEO or not, and, uh, but most of the decisions that have to be taken on a daily basis are actually taken in a company well below the CEO level. And you can all um, look in your areas of work, what you can do better, what you can do more efficiently, are there sustainable options? Can you show that it is better for the business financially or accelerating growth whilst it's also better for the planet? That is the task for all of us. In Unilever, we made progress because we got thousands of ideas from people in the company that convinced us that things could be done better. And we had um, an award that we did every year, which we called Unsung Heroes, where we recognized people at all levels in the company for amazing things they did to make our company more resilient, more, um, more uh, sustainable, etc. And you'd be surprised what the knowledge is in there. My final point is, is really where the big change is coming from in society these days. It's definitely from young people, but it's actually also from employees and companies. This is um, surprising to me even. Uh, every company has a greater thorn burn now. Every CEO has children, and they're putting pressure on the leaders to really change. Um, we see now for the first time walkouts or uh, boycotts, if you want to, that we've never seen before. Even companies like Google or Facebook or Microsoft or many others, uh, Amazon, where people are threatening to walk out because the commitments on climate change aren't big enough. Or where people, if they don't walk out, refuse to work. And one of the biggest challenges now is attracting talent. We see engagement scores correlating with responsible behavior. So it does mean that each and all of us individually are making a difference that is showing up in these collective numbers. And that's a good thing because it's for all of us that we need to change this. Good. So I think we have time for maybe one or two quick ones. Uh, question for you, Werner. Um, it's about more cross divisional collaboration on sustainability. So are there any initiatives to cross collaborate among divisions to improve sustainability and utilize experience, for example, from consumer health to increase sustainability in radiology as an, uh, as an example? Uh, yeah, we do that, but uh, the main drivers are the ones that uh, we can make uh, and drive a difference at scale. Uh, and that happens uh, to be the fact along the 100 million targets that I mentioned before, uh, and then of course enterprise-wide, uh, the work on uh, our carbon footprint, uh, and of course in crop, the net 30% reduction uh, in agriculture. Having said that, uh, there is always that cross-fertilization that is going on. So uh, our consumer health business is the best source you know, to get consumer and customer insights and intelligence on how to get there. The second one is that uh, we, of course, lever between crop and uh, our pharma business uh, the access to your know, underprivileged families. Yeah, so uh, you're an underprivileged farmer who lives in your know, 
uh, subsistency uh, is most likely also uh, your family uh, with a woman that would uh, you know, greatly benefit uh, from family planning. Yeah, so we do lever both uh, you know, in particular when it comes to you know, areas like, like rural India, where also our global smallholder initiative uh, is uh, run from uh, with our uh, India head. So these are the areas that we lever. Uh, of course, when it comes to technology, uh, the new technologies, uh, be it you know, in the area of digital, or if you look at, uh, um, let's say, uh, uh, new new technologies uh, in the area of gene editing, uh, those bring new, better, and faster solutions yeah, to one of the biggest challenges we have actually in this case, both in pharmaceuticals and also in crop science. Yeah, We, are, we have similar foundational technologies that we can lever across the company, yes. Oh, um, a quick one for you, Paul. What is the single most important thing that Werner can do to engage employees at Bayer with sustainability? Well, I think he's doing it. I have a great respect for mm -hmm. Werner. What you've seen in the COVID is that um, uh, companies that have done best and and regained uh, or maintained the high level of trust and engagement, which seems uh, to be the case also in, in Bayer, are, are leaders that operate with a high level of uh, empathy, compassion, a certain level of humanity, humility, are purpose-driven, think multi-generational, embrace the broader partnerships. And I think that's very much the, the camp where Werner is. These are the leaders that instill trust and, and create a following. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, I don't think we're dealing here actually with a crisis of climate change or inequality of food security. This in essence is a crisis of apathy, of greed, of selfishness. And here you have a leader that embodies absolutely the opposite, that not only deserves all the support, but I think is is uh, gaining that support that is needed to drive. Well on the way to do so my full support and, and more importantly, also stay the course. If you as an employee are not fully convinced or if you don't think it's the right way, I strongly encourage you to start with yourself. Um, you know, uh, from the uh, 13th century poet in Iran said, uh, I used to be smart and I wanted to change the world. Now I'm wise and I'm changing myself. I think that's where we need to start with all of us to give the support to Werner in a challenging job like this, in a world that is changing extremely fast to ensure that uh, not only you are successful in buyer, but what frankly I care about is that you are actually making lives better for these hundreds of millions of people that you're well on the way of doing. And that I would spend all my life and all my time to working hard for and supporting Werner to not have that be interrupted. That alone is a important enough mission for all of us to support. Excellent. So we are coming closer to already uh, to the end of, of the session. Maybe just a quick one. Um, I mean, after uh, you know listening to you all the challenges, but also all the opportunities. So are you pessimistic or optimistic about the future? You both. Optimistic. Well, I'd say an optimist and a pessimist have the same lives, but an optimist has a healthier life. So like Werner, <laughs> I would always pick an optimist. But but you know, often when you think pessimistic, it doesn't lead to anything. It makes you depressed and it leads you into to a direction that frankly isn't an answer for anybody. I would describe it as prisoner of hope. I think we have uh, technology that is always under surprises us uh, how quickly that goes. So technology is helping us. We are at the point where the cost of not acting is higher than the cost of acting. So it really makes good business sense. This is opportunity. We see the young people waking up and uh, becoming really passionate advocates of that change and want to not only be at the table, but they want to sometimes have the table. And then we see now at the point, don't underestimate that, that the financial market is starting to move because they're reading the signals on the wall. So you put all these things together and we really are starting to see as Werner said, not anymore the discussions on why should we do this, but how can we accelerate? And for companies that understand that, that, that are able to internalize that, translate that to clear action, I think they're well placed. The ones that continue to deny that, I think they're already heading to the graveyard of dinosaurs. Yeah, maybe maybe I can 
briefly compliment my, my one word statement of optimistic uh, for a second beyond and in addition to what um, uh, what Paul has just said. Uh, if I look at the world, um, you know, I want to make a lasting contribution. I think all of us want to do that. And uh, what helps tremendously is a can do attitude uh, and the confidence of really being able to contribute because that is what is really energizing. Being pessimistic about it would be the contrary. Yeah, if you put yourself in doubt on whether it is really valuable that you contribute, uh, it's actually an energy and uh, uh, yeah, it's really an energy drain. Uh, but waking up in the morning and saying, you know, this is another day where I'm going to do good things yeah, that I believe in and I can do that in a company that has the right vision and the right purpose. What a tremendous opportunity yeah, that we aid each and every one of us can make she lasting difference to many, many, many people. Yeah, uh, from life saving yeah, to giving them better livelihoods every single day. Yeah, and that is totally inspiring. And it's actually rather than an energy drain is actually a source of energy. Yeah, so you're having having that you know, when you get up in the morning every day, make sure that you that you actually do. It's actually very difficult. I have to say for me yeah, to really get tired at that. Good. So, uh, Paul Werner, thank you very much uh, for this interesting discussion. Thanks for your passion, your drive, your inspirational leadership, and thanks everyone also for joining this discussion, for raising your questions. And with that, thank you very much and, and see you soon, I hope. Thanks, Carlotta. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, no, Great thank session. you guys. Enjoy the book, but above all, be safe and enjoy the holiday season. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.